New York City, 1970s. Population, 8 million. Reported violent crimes, 1,461,523. Reported murders, 19,048. Total reported cases of burglary, larceny, robbery, and vehicle theft, 9,153,690. By 1975, the unemployment rate was 12%. Thousands of city workers were laid off due to economic crisis. The filth, the violence, and the overall sense of lawlessness would create a shitstorm of epic proportions, even creating areas of the city where any outsider with a sense of survival wouldn't dare enter into. Times Square the crossroads of the world would become a sex mecca filled with pimps, prostitutes, and a bevy of sex clubs, peep shows, and X-rated theaters. A place where anyone's thirst for sexual desire was fulfilled. 1970 marked the beginning of what's known as the golden age of the mafia. Soon, they would have a say in all the moving parts of the city, and their sex industry rackets would penetrate heavily into the violent concrete jungle and their growing arms stretching out over the United States. While researching this story, it seemed at every turn a new man with the title of Porn King would arise. Just who was the true king is seemingly up for debate. Parts of my research also left me unsettled at times, with many questions remaining unanswered. Seems that much of the dark history of this subject is yet to even be uncovered. I'll try my best to make sense of it all and shed light on some information not often discussed, if ever. This is Sex, Smut, and the Mob at the Crossroads of the World, Part 1. Nineteen seventy two Deep Throat A film which revolutionized porn cinema was released. The film follows Linda Lovelace, real name Linda Borman, a woman trying to find herself through a sexual frustration. After visiting a doctor, she discovers that her clitoris is in back of her throat. The only way for her to achieve orgasm is to fillet men, taking them deep into her throat, which is where the term Deep Throat arises from. The film captivated audiences and soon made its way into the mainstream lore with celebrities and politicians even commenting on it. The film was released at a time where obscenity laws in the USA were heavy and the law had a watchful eye on the industry. Despite this, the film, which had a Hollywood movie style plot and character development, still took off. Today, The film is still widely considered one of the most profitable films ever made, with figures ranging from 30 to 600 million dollars in revenue for its creators. But who were the creators of this film? The film was written and directed by Gerard Rocco Damiano, a Bronx-born filmmaker responsible for many other early smash hits of the porn world. Films like The Devil and Miss Jones and Memories Within Miss Angie. 
In the credits, the film is presented by Vanguard Films, and the name of Lou Perry shows up as producer. Lou Perry, a.k.a. Louis Butchie Pereno, along with his brother, Joseph Pereno, were the head of a film company known as Bryanston Pictures. The brothers Pereno took a loan from their father, Anthony Pereno, which assisted in financing the film. Deep Throat was the first film that they were involved in. Their father, Anthony Pereno, was a capo in the Colombo crime family, who got a start working in the Joseph Profaci family. Anthony's brother, Joe the Whale Pereno, and nephew, also by the name of Joseph, were involved in the Colombo crime family and the porn rackets as well. Anthony and Joe the Whale Pereno's roots in organized crime went back to the early 20th century, where their father, Giuseppe Pereno, was a Sicilian mobster, an associate of Salvatore Maranzano. He would make his name during Prohibition and was a powerful figure in Brooklyn, but he would be killed in 1931. The Perinos made so much money from Deep Throat, they started expanding their empire to porn bookshops and other smut entities. They grew a massive distribution operation, which sent films across state lines and as far as Japan. The office of Louis Perino was constantly bombarded with calls from people who wanted the film. They fell into something massive. At a time when legitimate businessmen and film companies wouldn't touch porn, the mob was here to take the reins and carry the torch into the 1970s and beyond. The Perino family film company, Bryanston Pictures, would also delve deeper into legitimate film projects. They distributed the cult horror classic, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, worldwide in 1974. They would also distribute John Carpenter's directorial debut, Dark Star, in 1974. It's believed the Colombo family first got involved in the porn rackets in the late 1960s. John Sonny Francis was supplying 8mm porn films to sex shops around New York City, most notably Times Square, the crossroads of the world. These films would be used in coin-operated peep show machines. The Columbos would eventually open up a porn processing lab in Brooklyn. This was known as Allstate Film Labs. Louis Perena would take ownership of the lab, and banana mobster Michael Mickey Zaffirano was also said to be running the everyday operations. Michael Mickey Zaffirano was born in 1920s Manhattan. He was a capo in the Bonanno crime family and was known to be a very close associate of Carmine Galante, as well as being a former bodyguard to Joe Bonanno. Mickey would become a big hitter in the porn industry. Prior to this, in the 1950s, he would become heavily involved in truck hijacking, safe cracking, and numerous burglaries. He owned restaurants and a sportswear company which he used as fronts for mob activity. He would become one of the nation's porn kingpins during the 1970s operating mostly out of Times Square, but maintaining power in Florida and Los Angeles as well. Eventually, Zaffirano would become owner of Times Square Real Estate. He owned 207 West 48th Street and buildings between 1603 and 1607 Broadway, which was right off 42nd Street. He would also acquire the 1601 Broadway building where he leased a ground floor establishment to powerful Genovese crime family capo Matty the Horse Ionello. Ionello owned and operated the Mardi Gras topless bar at this location. Matty the Horse had interests in numerous clubs and restaurants around New York City, including his family-owned Umberto's Clam House, where he was in the kitchen on April 7, 1972, when Joe Gallo was shot dead. Zaffirano maintained that he was solely a real estate magnet and was only leasing these locations to numerous purveyors of film pornography, peep shows, sex magazines, and other shows. However, law enforcement viewed Zaffirano as a porn czar and maintained that he was one of the most powerful money men in the industry. Aside from Matty Ionello's Mardi Gras topless bar, some of the other establishments in Zaffirano owned buildings were the Pussycat Theater, the Pussycat Show Center, which sold X-rated books and hosted peep shows. The Broadway Arms, which was a club that catered to gay men. The Cat's Eye, which served as a topless disco bar. And lastly, the Leave it to Beaver Lounge, 
which was a massage parlor. Another Colombo venture was Screw Magazine, founded in 1968 by Al Goldstein and Jim Buckley. Screw was a weekly tabloid paper, which published obscene columns, photos, and even a listing where one can get in contact with local hookers. At its peak, it was selling over 100,000 copies a week. They gained funding and distribution through Richard DiMatteo, a member of the Gallo faction of the Colombo family. DiMatteo operated Astro News, which was a major distributor of porn magazines in New York. However, it's believed that Colombo mobster and future Genovese mobster Albert Gallo was the real brains of the operation at the time. Al Goldstein was at the helm of Screw Magazine until 2003. Al Goldstein's long career in smut was marred with numerous obscenity charges and court cases. In the mid-70s, he hosted a public access show called Midnight Blue and numerous other TV ventures throughout his career. When asked about the Mafia distributing his papers, he would say, We have no options as to who we deal with. No legitimate distributor will touch us. I'd deal with Hitler if I had to. I'd deal with anyone I can do business with. And later he would say, The people that would distribute Screw are like Damon Runyon characters. Do I know that they're Mafia? No. I read the New York Times and I was talked to by the FBI. But how would I know? Was there ever a threat from these people to carry me? No. But is it coincidental that no one else has ever come to me in 30 years to distribute Screw? There must be arrangements. You have a cut. Things are carved out. Damon Runyon was an early 20th century short story writer who appeared in numerous newspaper columns. He often wrote about gangsters, hustlers, actors, and high society Manhattan types. These Runyon-esque type characters were the only means of survival for guys like Al Goldstein. Astro News would distribute Screw for decades, as well as another company by the name of Star Distributors, headed by Gambino mobster Robert DiBernardo, another powerful porn purveyor making a name for himself. Robert DiBernardo, aka DB, is believed to first be affiliated with the DeCavalcanti family, but later becoming a made man with the Gambino crime family. DiBernardo was born 1937. He was involved in labor racketeering and extortion, but his career can be summed up by his large influence in the porn rackets. Robert DiBernardo would also become a close associate of Mickey Zaffirano over the years and form many alliances in the sex establishment industry and within distributors of porn materials. Upon entering the Gambino family, he would fall under the tutelage of Ettore Zeppi, a man who was made capo by Carlo Gambino. DiBernardo was the main financier and decision maker of star distributors which the government would describe as the National Distributor of Porn Magazines. In 1975, the New York Times listed Theodore Rothstein as president and Nathan Kramer as secretary treasurer. Despite this, it was well known by those in law enforcement and mob circles that Robert D.B. DiBernardo had last say in all star distributors operations. DiBernardo's money and influence stretched out across the United States. He was said to control the businesses of Reuben Sturman, or pornographer from Ohio, who had a massive porn magazine distribution and founded the sex toy company Doc Johnson. According to the Associated Press, Mafia figure turned informant Aladena Fratiano told the commission that if Sturman has a problem, he goes to Robert DiBernardo. Sturman and DiBernardo were like partners. Plus, if DiBernardo wanted Sturman to do something, he would do it, said Fratiano. Furthermore, DiBernardo was described to Fratiano as the main man in the entire country. While DiBernardo was a powerful made man, it's believed that he wasn't a violent type and was made despite ever having to commit a murder. He was a smart businessman who lived a quiet family man lifestyle on Long Island. As the 1970s went on, and D.B. gained more power, 
he became closer with boss Paul Castellano. Despite Paul's aversion to pornography, he had no problem taking the millions of dollars that D.B. was kicking up to the family. Later on, FBI bugs caught DiBernardo talking about Castellano, and this is what D.B. had to say. He uses me. He makes me look bad. Look at D.B. He makes money in porn, like he's some kind of high and mighty Mr. Fucking Clean. Does it stop him from taking his cut? Sorry, Paul, you don't want to touch those dollars. There's pussy on him. <laughs> He'll take him anyway. He wants it both ways. Get paid. Act clean. My ass. Another important porn kingpin at the time was a man by the name of Richard Basciano, who would become a partner and very close associate of Robert DiBernardo. Basciano kept a low profile during his life and rarely gave an interview. But there are some things we do know about him. Basciano was born 1925 in Baltimore, Maryland. He came from a family of boxers and served in the Navy during World War II. In the 1960s, he would get involved in newspaper distributing and commercial real estate in Baltimore. In 1966, Basciano would have his first brush with the law. He would be indicted on mail fraud charges and given three years probation. After probation, he makes his way to Philadelphia where he meets a man by the name of Sam Rappaport. He would jump in the porn business with Sam and form an alliance with Robert D.B. DiBernardo. Basciano would become a wealthy man from the porn rackets and in the mid-70s, he would acquire the building at 669 8th Avenue. He would open up what become known as the McDonald's of Sex. The Show World Center. A 22,000 square foot space which housed peep shows, X-rated flicks, sex shows, and a place where one can buy adult books. Bastiano was becoming a real estate magnet and was starting to take over the former operations of Martin Hodas, aka the King of the Peeps. Hodas was responsible for bringing the peep show scene to Times Square and revolutionizing the idea. After a brush with the law and being indicted on tax evasion charges in the 70s, Hodas would step away and Bastiano would take over some of Hodas' former operations. Bastiano's show world enterprise would grow over the years and other satellite locations would pop up. There was the Show Folly Center located at 711 7th Avenue. Lake Owls at 136 West 42nd Street. The Pussycat Show Center in Zaffirano owned building at 1605 Broadway. The Show Palace at 678th Avenue. Show Center at 247 West 42nd Street. Adult Video World at 210 West 42nd Street. And the Roxy Burlesque, which was originally owned by Shelley Wilson the daily operations being taken care of by a man named Gus Kalevis, a pimp and shadowy figure with a dark, seedy history. While Bastiano kept out of the limelight, maintaining a beautiful penthouse apartment above Showworld Center on 8th Avenue, it was clear to law enforcement and FBI officials that much of the seed money and daily operations of these establishments had strong ties to organized crime. With Di Bernardo being one of his major partners and a made man in the Gambino crime family, I personally don't think it's an outlandish thing to say that Richard Basciano was an associate of the Gambino family, either by choice or by default. The picture is rather clear to me. Richard was a powerful man in Times Square area and his influence in the 1970s New York City's sex industry cannot be understated. Showworldlegacy.com is a website ran by former friends and colleagues of Richard Basciano. It documents the history of his establishments and his presence in Times Square. This is what they had to say about Richard. Often the press, in their endless pursuit of recycling trash, described Richie as the king of porn or the sultan of smut etc. 
moniker is coined by the tabloids on a bad news day. Ritchie himself despised such labels and vehemently maintained throughout several decades of disparagement that he ran his operations cookie cutter clean. And in truth, Ritchie's sex emporiums were sleek, immaculately designed, and rife with disinfectant. Whereas other peep shows in comparison bordered on closure by the New York Health Department for filth and contamination. Ritchie's state-of-the-art live peep show set a standard of ambiance, unlike any other adult establishment in the history of Times Square. Peddling porn in the periphery of the mainstream, show world itself stood as a fetish-fueled bastion to perversion, a masturbatory mecca for tourists, executives, misfits, and the curious, and quintessentially all that is New York. Now let's go back to 1972, the same year the smash hit Deep Throat was released. Paul Rothenberg, another porn king in his own right, opens up Arrow Film Labs at 75 Spring Street in Manhattan with his partner Anthony Argola. As a front, he's processing film and video projects for commercial clients, but his bread and butter was the porn industry in which he was processing numerous X-rated films for clients in the industry. Paul Rothenberg was known to be the largest processor of porn flicks in the New York area. He had been arrested a few times for his involvement in the industry before the year of 1972, when him and his partner got a knock at their door. Enter Nino Gaggi, a made man in the Gambino crime family, and his cohort, an up-and-coming associate of the Gambino crime family by the name of Roy Albert DeMeo, who was barely getting started in his murderous career, which would rival some of the top hitmen in the history of the mob, his crew often being referred to as a ruthless gang of serial killers. Upon entering the office, Nino and Roy tell Rothenberg that he should align with them in order to improve his business. Rothenberg says, No thanks, guys. <laughs> Come on. Roy smacks him across the face and pulls out a pistol. It ain't fucking up with discussion, you understand? We'll be back next week. Rothenberg has no choice but to give in. Roy Domato and Nino Gaggi have officially entered the porn rackets. Along with Di Bernardo, they would bring in a massive load to the Gambino crime family. A year later, in 1973, Rothenberg and Argola are raided by law enforcement. They uncover his lucrative cash business and numerous X-rated films the lab was processing. Police would ask Rothenberg and Argola who Roy DeMeo was when his name appeared on checks made out to Roy and cashed at the borrow of Brooklyn Credit Union, where Roy was on the board. Argola claimed, business expenses. Rothenberg claimed, extortion payments. Roy would meet Rothenberg and give him money for his defense fund and a diamond encrusted watch. Law enforcement begged Rothenberg's lawyer to have him cooperate. Whatever his decision would be, never came to fruition. Paul Rothenberg and Anthony Argola were in deep shit. Nina and Roy also had a lot to worry about. On July 27, 1973, Roy instructs Rothenberg to meet him Sunday, July 29th at the Landmark Diner on Northern Boulevard in Roslyn, Long Island. Just a few miles outside city limits and not far from Rothenberg's home in Sands Point, Long Island. When they meet, Roy and Rothenberg walk into an alley adjacent to the diner. Where Roy puts two bullets in Rothenberg's head. This would become known as Roy DeMeo's first murder. The murder made big news. Argola was on a boat at the time of the murder, and soon the case would go nowhere. Despite detectives witnessing Roy and Argola meeting on two occasions, Anthony Argola refused to cooperate. At 32 years old, Roy would fall deeper into the porn rackets. In 1973, the same year Roy would kill Paul Rothenberg, 
a mysterious man would enter into the United States and begin to form a dark career most have never discussed. He would soon form an alliance with Roy Albert DeMeo. The following segment and the details discussed have been obtained through the FBI files of Roy Albert DeMeo, which were made public through a Freedom of Information Act request. I will use reenactments while discussing the findings in order to gain a clearer picture of how I believe incidents may have occurred based on the findings in these files. I'll attempt to uncover a lesser known member of Roy DeMeo's vicious crew, the murder machine. 1973, the Twin Towers in downtown Manhattan were ready to open, with the remaining World Trade Center buildings being completed over the next 14 years. The city was well on its way to entering one of its most violent eras. A 20-year-old Greek national by the name of Gus Kalevis is visiting the city. Becoming enthralled with the atmosphere and looking to make a name for himself, he jumps ship in Manhattan Harbor. He won't be returning back home. Within a year's time, he marries a 16-year-old American girl, which solidifies his United States citizenship. By 1974, Gus has fashioned himself into a pimp. He's running a whorehouse out of a motel in Poughkeepsie, New York. He rents numerous rooms around New York and transports prostitutes back and forth from upstate New York into New York City. He soon makes connections with organized crime figures, where he obtains financing from loan sharks. This would bolster his operations, and he would soon bring in a lot of money for himself. In 1976, Gus divorces his first wife. Sometime in the mid-70s, he meets Roy DeMeo, a violent Gambino crime family associate who's been making his bones with the family for almost 10 years and has already assembled a core group of killers and thieves operating out of Brooklyn. Are you Roy? I was told I can talk to you about my operation. My name is Gus. Yeah, I'm Roy. What's with the accent? I'm from Greece. I've been here for a couple of years. Yeah, I heard about you. You got a pretty impressive operation going on. Have you met Robert? DB. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I could help you. Here, take this card. You gotta meet me in Flatlands at my bar, the Gemini. When I call you, you come and you see me. No fucking bullshit. These two would form an alliance. In the same year of Gus's divorce, in 1976, he started discussing plans with Roy DeMeo to murder a prostitute. If I wanted to get rid of somebody, would you know how? <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? That girl that I spoke to you about. If I wanted to make her disappear, would you know how? Yeah, I have my ways. You just gotta let me know. And it's done. I don't come back here a hundred times asking about it either. Make up your fucking mind. Instead of murdering the young prostitute, Gus decides he's gonna marry her in order to maintain his citizenship status, which was in jeopardy due to his recent divorce. According to FBI documents, by the time 1976 came around, they considered Gus Kalevis a member of Roy DeMeo's crew. Gus would report to Roy and would go on to operate at least a dozen places of prostitution and pornography with financing from the Gambino crime family. The FBI maintains that Gus's main backers were Roy DeMeo, Robert DiBernardo, and a redacted name which is only described as an associate of the Gambino crime family and a business partner of Di Bernardo. Who could this partner have been? We know that Richard Basciano held numerous real estate in Times Square and was heavily involved in the porn industry as well as being a business partner of Robert Di Bernardo. Theodore Rothstein who was a partner in Star Distributors also was a Di Bernardo partner. Moving forward we'll continue to try and get a clear picture of the situation. 
In 1980, Genovese crime family mobster Eddie Vassallo is murdered by Genovese mobster David Patillo, an old school hitman from the Luciano era who was known for cross-dressing while committing hits. We'll talk more about him in part two. Vassallo was a loan shark and financial backer of a whorehouse located at 1718 Route 88 in Bricktown, New Jersey. After his death, DiBernardo hands the position of loan sharker, financial backer, to Roy DeMeo. Gus Kalevis is put as the head, as owner, operator, and would soon purchase the whorehouse with Roy DeMeo for $500,000. DeMeo would put up most of the money. The lease for the establishment would be changed to the corporate name Southgate Trading Corp, which would serve as a way to conceal the real owners. The whorehouse would adopt the name The Harem Pleasure Spa. Kalevis was often sighted at the spa and was said to drive a Rolls Royce from New York City to the spa. I was able to confirm on the website showworldlegacy.com, who mentioned Kalevis briefly, that he did indeed drive a Rolls Royce. FBI claims that whenever a problem arose at Harem, Gus would get a call at the Showworld building in Manhattan in order to ask him what to do. But why was Gus at the show world, an establishment owned by Richard Basciano, in which Basciano maintained a penthouse apartment? I was able to confirm through an anonymous source connected to the old show world that Kalevis also had an apartment at the show world building. The true extent of Kalevis's business ventures with Basciano is quite murky to say the least. Prior to Basciano obtaining the property at 244 West 42nd Street, which housed the Roxy Burlesque, the Roxy Burlesque Theater was owned by Shelley Wilson and Gus Kalevis. Gus and Shelley also ran numerous other porn shops and theaters throughout Manhattan. Gus was also doing business with the Gambinos, as well as Basciano. The FBI files of Roy DeMeo claim that Gus Kalevis, Roy DeMeo, and Robert DiBernardo were financial backers of the Roxy as well as the show world, with Richard Basciano being the major figurehead and proprietor of show world and numerous real estate properties, which housed all of his sex businesses. This huge claim shines a spotlight on the real magnitude of Roy's involvement in the porn rackets and his influence in the industry. However, the anonymous person I had a brief conversation with maintain that Gus had absolutely no ownership or control of any Bastiano Showworld Enterprises, only acknowledging his involvement with the Roxy Burlesque. They also claim to know nothing about Roy DeMeo, only finding out about him in the 1990s. But I asked the question, why would they have known about Roy DeMeo? And why would Gus maintain an apartment high above the Showworld Center? Seems like a real convenient place to be if you had some kind of stake in the business downstairs. Along with his Rolls Royce, Kalevis was said to own a motorboat named Princess and by 1980 owned his own building in Manhattan. Him, Roy, and other associates were also paying numerous members of the NYPD in Midtown Manhattan. They would look the other way while many of these establishments were operating as whorehouses. December 4th 1981. Joseph Vigiano, a young man who worked in places of pornography and prostitution, goes missing. Vigiano was an associate of Kalevis, but had fallen deep into debt with him. If you're in debt to Kalevis, in effect, you're in debt to Roy DeMeo and the Gambino crime family. Kalevis calls for a meeting with Vigiano at the Showworld office apartment. Vigiano enters and is met by Gus Kalevis and Roy DeMeo. DeMeo shoots and kills Vigiano. After this, DeMeo proceeds to dismember Vigiano with Gus's assistance. Vigiano is never seen again. Gus Kalevis gets a taste of what the Gemini method is all about. The Vigiano family was from Canarsie, and the name Roy DeMeo was no secret to them. 
Joseph's father Alvigiano and brother Paul were also said to be connected to the Times Square porn rackets. They would ask around and intensely try to locate Joseph, fearing something bad had happened to him. On December 21st, 1981, Al and Joseph Vigiano were walking home in Canarsie when they were assassinated gangland style in the streets. While the exact shooters are not known, it certainly came out of Roy's crew. In 1982, the harem spa in Bricktown was raided by police. Several prostitutes were arrested and would plead guilty. After that, Gus changes the name to Spa 88 and changes the corporate ownership name to ILAC Enterprises. In 1982, Kalevis told associates that he had been operating numerous businesses with a million dollars in loan shark money from Roy DeMeo. He also went on to tell them that Roy was a silent partner in the Harem Spa in Bricktown, New Jersey, as well as the Roxy Theater on 42nd Street. He was also observed at known Mafia social clubs. Furthermore, Gus and Roy were observed meeting weekly for morning conversations at a West Side Diner in Manhattan, where Roy was delivered suitcases full of money for the Gambino crime family. In 1983, Roy DeMeo was murdered. Kalevis wants to minimize his connections. He sells his majority share of the Roxy Theater. He's later arrested for trying to bribe officials in New Jersey in order to influence a lawsuit against Spa 88. He's found guilty along with law enforcement officials who were taking bribes. The property would soon be seized by New Jersey State Police. In 1983, he would be questioned about his involvements with Roy DeMeo. He would admit to his business relationships with Roy, and in 1984, he'd be charged with 18 others in a federal RICO case against Paul Castellano and many other mobsters. It's my opinion that he must have struck a sweet deal with prosecutors which shed light on his numerous exploits. He would go to jail in 86 and be released in 1988, with many officials calling for his deportation. No word on where this long, forgotten, shadowy figure is today. The Pereno family, who made a name for themselves, first producing and distributing the X-rated classic, Deep Throat, had many legal issues in the 70s and 80s, and even into the 90s. They would be hit with numerous obscenity charges and trafficking of pornography across state lines. The Perenos would do time in prison in the late 70s for their deep throat exploits. In 1981, Lewis and Joseph would do time in relation to obscenity charges in Florida. Upon release, they were supposed to exit the porn industry. However, they would violate parole and be sentenced again to prison in 1993 after getting back into the porn business. In 1982, Joseph Perena would be killed and his father injured in Gravesend, Brooklyn. They were attacked outside the home of Veronica Zarao, an innocent bystander who would also lose her life in the incident. The hit was said to take place because Joseph Sr. and Joseph Jr. were pocketing many of the deep throat profits and not kicking up to the Colombo leadership. It's believed that Anthony Perino himself gave up his own family members when he informed Carmine Persico of his brother and his nephew's misdeeds. The eldest Anthony Perino passed away in 1996. Louis Butchie Perino, aka Lou Perry, passed away in 1999 from lung cancer. In 1980, Michael Mickey Zaffirano was indicted on charges of conspiracy and interstate transportation of obscene materials in the FBI's My Porn Investigation, short for Miami Porn. He would die as FBI agents were readying to serve him a subpoena in New York City. He maintained his real estate holdings up until his death, and his son John Zaffirano would take over the real estate holdings after. After the murder of Paul Castellano, new Gambino boss John Gotti would promote Robert D.B. DiBernardo to captain. DiBernardo would also get caught up with Zaffirano in the early 80s for the My Porn investigation. In 1986, he was ready to be brought up on charges including the trafficking of child pornography. He would soon go missing. 
At the time, he was also said to be disagreeing with some of the happenings at the top of the Gambino family. FBI claims that according to a confidential source, Robert DiBernardo was also very indifferent to the killing of Frank DiCicco and quickly took over his union rackets, which in the FBI's informant's eyes put him in the line of fire. Angelo Quack Quack Ruggiero would label him subversive, although Sammy the Bull Gravano would later claim that Angelo was in debt to Robert. On June 5, 1986, Robert was lured to Sammy the Bull's basement offices of his drywall company in Bensonhurst. He would be murdered by Sammy with Gambino mobster Joseph Peruta assisting. After DiBernardo's death, porn king, real estate magnate, and business partner Richard Basciano claimed that he was surprised to learn of DiBernardo's mafia affiliations. If you believe that, then I got an island off the coast of Italy called Capri to sell you. Roy DeMeo was killed in 1983. He would die without a criminal record, and most of his exploits wouldn't be uncovered until the mid-1980s, till today, where we are still learning new things about his vicious crew's career in wholesale murder, thievery, and pornography. He would also be suspected of being involved in child pornography during his time in the porn rackets. At one point, he would get back to Nino Gaggi, that Roy was involved in the trafficking of child pornography along with the likes of DiBernardo. He was told to cut it out, but it's unlikely that he did. It would later come out that in 1976, Roy killed Lucchese mobster and Times Square porn king in his own right, Joseph Joe Bikini Bronchini. They had an altercation, which I can only assume had to do with porn interest in and around Times Square. Joe Bikini assaults Roy, but Roy could do nothing to the made man. He was advised by Nino Gaggi that he could kill Bikini, but he should make it look like an accident. On May 19, 1976, Roy and crew would shoot Bronchini to death at his auto sales shop on Roosevelt Avenue in Queens. This and many other of Roy's exploits were uncovered later by the likes of Dominic Montilio, Broadway Freddy Denain, and Vito Arena. And lastly, Richard Basciano. He would maintain his empire and go mostly unscathed during his career in the porn and sex industry, although he would be questioned by law enforcement over the years about his connections to organized crime and his interests in the sex business. As the years went on, many of his businesses would close, with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani introducing many strict laws combating much of the sex happenings around Times Square and other areas of New York City. He would also sell many of his properties. On June 5, 2013, a building owned by Basciano and his company, STB Investments, would collapse. The collapsed building on Market Street in Philadelphia killed seven people and injured 12. Richard would have to pay $27 million of a $227 million settlement against him. Richard would maintain his show world estate but the original incarnation of Show World would close in 2008. He would also maintain residence in the penthouse apartment above Show World until his death in 2017, at age 91. Furthermore, in 2017, his estate would refinance his properties. According to TheRealDeal.com, which focuses on real estate news, entities tied to the estate of porn magnate Richard Basciano secured roughly $74 million to refinance two 8th Avenue properties months after plans were filed to turn them into office buildings. Granite Point Mortgage Trust Incorporated was the lender on the deals for 303 West 42nd Street and 300 West 43rd Street, according to a filing with the city's Department of Finance. The financing includes $26.2 million project loan and a $35 million project loan Bastiano's estate filed plans in 2018 to turn the Times Square properties into offices. The property at 303 West 42nd Street has long been known as the home of the infamous sex shop, Show World Center, one of the last remaining triple X stores that had survived the redevelopment of Times Square and the crackdown of porn shops in the 1990s. We'll speak more about Bastiano 
and others mentioned in this program in part two of Sex, Smut, and the Mob at the Crossroads of the World. Stay tuned. (laughs) 